Hello, good afternoon. If you wanted to come to the seminar, the other half of church, living out the one another commands once the formal church service is over, you are in the right place. And I have good news because this is the perfect way to bookend your day, to round out the experience of this most excellent PA conference. Uh, and another cliche I can't think of because we started the day talking about the one another commands and here we have an extension of living it out in a practical way as well. And this is a topic that Margie and Simon Gillam have been thinking about for some time and, have, and perhaps has been more uh, exacerbated by the COVID experience that we're all going through at the moment. Um, my name is Julia Williams. I'm a chaplain here at Moore College. Um, I also work at a wonderful organisation called Anglican Aid, and in today's context, I'm also the mother in the cheaper by the dozen story this morning. Um, Margie and Simon uh, and their two children served in Namibia with CMS for some time, and I was here the other day for first year welcome, and I noticed two Gillam names on the first year enrolments. I take it they're your children. Um, in another cross-promotion, Margie works for CMS, and if you're thinking about mission work, her role is to talk to people about what they're thinking about and whether the overseas mission is a good fit for them. And Simon is the actual vice principal here at Moore College. And I was trying to think about how to describe Simon. I've got three images in my mind. One is of him throwing his head back, laughing at a good story, or telling a good story from his old policing days, or... Uh, nodding seriously with a furrowed brow, listening carefully to something serious. Or the other one is his head tilted on the side, thinking about how to make something better or fix something. So, and I've had the privilege of leading a class with Simon last year as well. I think they're both eminently qualified to speak on this topic. So let me pray for us before we begin. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this great day and the opportunity to think so deeply um, and practically about um, issues concerning our Christian living. Help us this afternoon to concentrate and to stay with it. Help us not to feel overwhelmed by the call um, on our lives to live for you and to serve each other, but instead to feel inspired and encouraged to um, keep serving you and to keep serving each other. Um, in your son's name, amen. Uh, the other good news is I have minties because if you're like me, you stayed up and watched the tennis. And I would advise you to ignore the words of Dr. Peter Orr from this morning about trivial conversations after church. Is that correct? <laughs> I hand over to Margie. Thanks, Julia. So it's lovely to see some, some faces that we know really well and some people we don't know. So just as a quick introduction for those that we don't know, um, Simon and I did... We're in church ministry for about 10 years, um, first up in Musselbrook in the Newcastle Diocese and then an FIAC church in Maitland. Um, and then after that, we've been, we were in Africa for eight years, serving in a Bible college, but again, involved in church, um, in two different churches over there. Um, but ironically, we've been asked to do this, I think mostly because we were raving about the church that we went to when we came back, which is we had nothing to do with starting or planning or organising the, the one another part after church. So we were raving about it so much that we were asked by Jane to do this elective before COVID, before the whole COVID thing. Um, but we just wanted to acknowledge at the start, it's thanks to the amazing work of Pete and Isabel Lynn and followed by Jane and Anna Davidson and Stephen and Rebecca Sheed who um, have put in many, many years of work at, at St Barnabas at Bosley Park, where we first learnt to actually start talking about the first half of church and the second half of church, and they never fail to talk about the first half of church and the second half of church. And of all the churches we've been to, it's the only church where you can guarantee you'll be at the second half of church for just as long as you were at the first half, if not longer, often longer. We're often still there two hours after church. And that's what made us think, what are they doing so differently? Um, so, you've done a lot of sitting around today, but so, so we just wanted to do a bit of an activity. This is sort of the workshoppy part of the day. Um, we, so we wanted you to just, with a couple of people near you, do a little bit of work um, thinking about what you learnt this morning. And we're really sorry for those who are online. If you're watching online with somebody, chat to them. If you're not, 
can we encourage you to just write down some answers to this question and we lament with you that we are online. We thank God for the technology, but we lament that actually this is what we're talking about that we miss with online church. Um, so the questions we'd like you to think about are going to come up on the screen. I trust those online at home can see them as well. And um, what is something that you learnt or were reminded of from Peter's talks this morning? And what might you stop doing, start doing, or do differently as a result of what you have heard today? And what changes would you like to see considered in your church, at the conference you run, at your home group, in your home group relationships with brothers and sisters as a result of what you've heard? So they're your three questions. If you need to move to find someone. Oh, yeah, and we're going to give you 10 minutes, so don't rush. You have 10 minutes to actually think through some answers to these questions and we'll pull you back with a few ideas in, a, in 10 minutes. Okay. If I can draw you back together. Just before we get started again, we forgot to say there's going to be questions at the end. Um, there's a Slido number on a bit of paper in your bag, but if you want me to just read it out. I'll just grab my glasses and I can read it out. The Slido number is 148593 for this elective, but it's on that bit of paper. Um, so, how did you find that? How easy was it to start a conversation? How did you go? So there was a question this morning. How did you go from chit-chat to actually having a proper conversation? How did you find it? <laughs> easy? Why, why easy, do you think? Because you're directed, yeah. Being given something to talk about, yep. Other people find it easy? Anyone find it difficult? No, nope. there you go, directing helps, doesn't it? Um, so, so, it might be a self-selecting group. Oh, we wondered, we did. As we were preparing this, we're going, this might not be the right group. I think it's, it's important to remember that, though. So I know from, and, I, and I'm not delusional enough to think we all feel totally secure in our own Bible knowledge. In our, so even in this group who find it easy to talk, some of these conversations actually make you a bit nervous because we're not really sure if we're going to have all the answers that people want. And what if my question that I ask somebody after church actually reveals that I haven't understood the sermon at all or haven't understood... Something? So there's that, that security thing of actually laying yourself bare when you go from the football or the weather or whatever it is that's so much easier to talk about. Um, but would any, a couple of people like to share from then that experience of actually bringing back to mind what Peter talked about, sharing it with the people and answering these questions. Is there something you, you were reminded of or encouraged by in this conversation just now? Be quiet for a minute and then everyone will want to talk at once, won't they? Was the conversation worth having? These conversations you just quite happily had? They were worth having? Yeah? Mm. Yes. Yeah, great, great. Um, I don't, do I need to repeat it? Yeah. So um, Adam was just saying that he, the lady he was talking to had the same um, highlight from the talks and the same thing that they wanted to apply to their life. So that may, you bring together and go, yeah, that's what I thought as well. Yep, so it just confirms. Not only does it confirm it in terms of educational theory that we may talk about sometimes, um, but, yeah, it just gets you excited. Yeah. Anything else? Yeah. Yeah, so so sorry, I'm not catching it all, but basically like so from the talk, my experience, you're putting someone else's experience in the talk, which actually elaborates a bit for you because their experience is different to yours. Yeah. yeah. Does that sound yep. Have I kind of rehashed it, okay? Yeah, yep, yep. Yeah, I think sometimes you have different things too, so I was like, of all the things, I don't know if other people's were, the thing that spoke out to me the most was 
Um, as evangelicals, we have a, a daily quiet time. Do we ever have a daily one another time? And just those sorts of things, you think, that's what sp stuck out for me. So if I can go and talk to people and say, did this stick out for you? You're either going to have Adam's experience that, yes, and that really charges it up, or actually, oh, yeah, I'd forgotten he said that. That's sort of that's going to charge it up, yeah. They're, they're, they're kind of quiet. <laughs> it's interesting, they said they have no trouble talking with, it, with one another, but the idea of doing it where it's going to be recorded up to the end. Oh, it's as a recording thing. Okay, we're just going <laughs> to... Simon's going to come up now, and we'll come back to this sort of conversation later. I wonder if there's anyone in the room who thought, oh, 10 minutes of talking with other people here, we paid to have an expert talk to us. <laughs> Anyone disappointed that you, you've been cheated out of time? No? Don't be offended. Um, we can sometimes have that expectation that when I go, I want to be spoken to from the front. That's the really valuable thing. And this thing of us talking with one another, we undervalue or devalue. And I think we just should recognise that that's a temptation for us because it doesn't just happen in conferences. It happens in our churches. And we're going to kind of spell out a few ways in which we think that that negative message of devaluing the importance of one another conversations in the congregation gets reinforced in our churches. So that we go beyond saying preaching is important or even the most important thing and it ends up being almost the only thing. Well, uh, we want to work with you this afternoon to get to the point where we talk about how you shift culture in church to see this one another ministry as vital and important. But in order to get to that point, first we're going to do a bit of, uh, a bit of history, a bit of working out where we, how did we get to where we are in our church gatherings now? What were the trends and develop, developments that have happened to get us to the point where we are now? Because it hasn't always been this way. Uh, and we want to get in the end uh, to a place where we can talk about the one another commands being modelled to one another and exercised by whole congregations and not just by experts. Some history first. Uh, three elements to the development I want to talk about. And the first element is uh, an accidental concentration on the ministry of the few. An accidental concentration on the ministry of the few. Because I don't think this is intended... But during COVID especially, and the move to online churches and stream churches, there's been some significant shifts in practice. Some of them are genuinely new developments, like streaming church. No, almost nobody was doing that two years ago. Now almost everybody's doing it. That's a mode. But there's a whole bunch of other shifts that have gone along with that, that we were already heading in those kinds of directions... And the move to online has just accelerated or amplified other changes. And I think the sum total of those changes is this accidental focus on the ministry of the few. Three elements. The first one is we have a growing culture of excellence. Or more, even more pointedly, we have a culture where our standards and expectations are continually being raised. We strive for excellence in our gatherings. Uh, that's commonly spoken of. I, I've, I've been in uh, team ministry conferences where this is uh, excellence is what we're aiming for. We want to be excellent. And obviously, that's a great thing. Um, you want to be more polished, less awkward. Um, and in the shift to online church, we now want online excellence. Okay? So excellence is a goal. I wonder if you've been tracking the way that people's expectations have been ratcheted up and ratcheted up and ratcheted up over the course of the last two years. 
Remember the first week that church was streamed, the first lockdown? If the pastor managed to get his iPhone on a stand, (laughs) so it was still, that was a win, right? And everyone was happy with that. But it wasn't too long before we started grumbling. And the sound quality wasn't good enough. And the background wasn't good enough. And then the lighting wasn't good enough. And the audio visuals weren't good enough. The music wasn't good enough. And what we're actually demanding now is studio quality online church. And if you don't think that's true, have us talk to the other people on your church staff team who are the ones who are supposed to be putting this out. Such high expectations of excellence, growing excellence. Despite most of us being nurtured in a church culture where for generations we have been stripping back anything that smacked of of being ornate or, or beautiful or that might possibly distract us visually from the ministry of the word, we have very quickly gotten to a point where we are entirely dissatisfied with anything other than studio quality church. Now, isn't that an interesting development that nobody signed up for, but everybody's on board with? It's excellence. And now what we have to do is to project excellence. And who on earth could argue against it? You don't... You don't want to walk out of here saying, well, what I really want is a less excellent church. I want us to do a lousy job of it. I want everybody to feel uncomfortable. Of course, excellence is good, right? But what does projecting excellence say to ordinary people? To be perfectly honest, some of us have a better face for radio than television, right? We don't all fit. And what does it say to those of us who don't have our lives perfectly together when all we project is excellence? So fewer and fewer people are seen to be qualified or acceptable to be up front. And this was happening before we went online, wasn't it? But it's a move that's been accelerated and amplified. And whether we're talking about stream church or physical gatherings, it's not the qualifications, the 1 Timothy 3 type qualifications that are excluding people from leadership and upfront ministries. It's, are they polished enough? Higher and higher expectations about excellence, particularly in presentation or, or even worse, in projection. Okay, so that's, that's one area in which we've become more and more focused on the ministry of the few because only a few people actually rate to be qualified to be involved. The second way in which our church gatherings have become increasingly focused on the ministry of the few is through our concern to guard the pulpit. And of course, I'm not wanting to pitch an argument that we should stop guarding the pulpit. Okay, guarding the pulpit, the, the idea that you're very careful about who you let preach in church is a very sound idea, right? But I do want you to just recognise the way that our churches have shifted within a generation. Within a generation. A generation ago, it was very common, uh, particularly for Anglican churches in Sydney, but for Baptist churches and all kinds of other churches and all over the country to have lay preachers regularly preaching. When I was a student here at college, most students preach 10 to 12 times a year. Now, there are some students who never get to preach uh, or to teach up front in their churches. And there are staff teams where people who are theologically trained and ordained never preach. Ministry is focused on fewer and fewer. 
Uh, there's been all kinds of shifts that have gone into that. But it's interesting to just step back and see the effect of that within a generation. It's a really significant change. It used to be that rectors were applauded, senior ministers were applauded for training lay preachers. That was seen to be a big part of their job, to train people to preach in their churches and to deploy them in ministry. But we're more and more professional and fewer and fewer people are fit to be up front. Again, not in a 1 Timothy 3 uh, kind of uh, qualification, but we've gone beyond that. And this, this concern to guard the pulpit has actually been extended to all other areas of what we do in our Sunday gatherings as well, so that there are fewer people involved in reading the Bible in praying, in leading services. There are fewer people up front than there used to be. There are fewer people involved in, uh, in leading things like music, a more select, uh, carefully selected group in all of these areas. It's an accidental concentration, I think, on the ministry of the few. But the, in this rising professionalism, I want to say, I think it's sometimes difficult to pick the difference between a professional class and a priestly caste. And I wonder if we've wound back some of our expression of the priesthood of all believers so that fewer and fewer people are enabled to be in front of us to lead us. But they're two good concerns, aren't they? The concern for excellence and a concern to guard the pulpit. But they've contributed to this accidental focus on the ministry of the few in our gatherings. There's a third trend, though, and I reckon it's harder to see anything positive about this at all. It's a trend toward more and more passive congregations. Uh, Peter spoke about this this morning as well. And again, this is a trend that was around before covid but it's been amplified enormously as churches have been streamed and put online. Um, as we moved away from formal liturgies, opportunities for congregational participation kind of shrunk down to singing. The, the, the only bit that was left for the congregation to do was to join in the songs. And then the government told us we couldn't sing. And we were out of ideas. What does it say if I can pre-record church and have it set to stream at a time on a Sunday morning and whether you come or not makes no difference? What does that say about our gathering? There's something really to be grieved there, isn't there? But even if we're not talking about streaming and now we're all back meeting together and we're going to be physically together this Sunday. How much would my absence be missed, my presence be missed? How much will change about that? Uh, does my attendance make any difference? Do I see that I have a role? So if most of the congregation don't get a speaking part in this show and we, uh, maybe, maybe we get a chorus, part in the chorus, now why am I talking about all these <laughs> performance things? Well, well, convince me it's not a performance. What am I doing there? What is my role? Why am I there? And if I'm not there, will that be noticed? Will it be noted? Will I be missed? Will my absence be mourned? And all these developments, what I'm saying is, I think they were all things that were already happening before COVID. In fact, Jane asked us to do this uh, workshop um, more than two years ago. Okay. It was already an issue 
But wow, in the last two years, we have moved at a really rapid pace further and further in these directions. And maybe I'm being kind in calling it an accidental focus on the ministry of the few. This affects everybody in church, but at this conference, I think it's worth saying that it disproportionately impacts the ministries that women have within our congregations. Because when we move to stream things, you think about the things that were cut completely and the things that were allowed to stay on, and of the things that were allowed to stay on, fewer and fewer opportunities for women to be involved in those ministries was one of the outcomes. And it is incredibly difficult to do the kind of one another stuff online. Uh, but in our rush to be excellent in projecting church, it's, it's just worth noting how we gave up on the other half of church. Thanks, Mark. We're just going to um, shift a little bit to think about church culture and the expectations um, that we have of church when we're there. I'm going to start with a little bit of church history, which is hilarious that I'm the one talking about church history. <laughs> um, but uh, if we think about the Anglican liturgy, which is great, love the Anglican liturgy, um, and it's been useful for us in ministry in so many ways. But when it was developed, it was part of a church where the aim of the church was to have a church within walking distance of every community, which meant that churches, when they got together, were people who lived together, worked together, socialised together, and this church liturgy was this one bit that you did on a Sunday morning together. So I think we need to think about then, it, while it's a vital, and I'm so glad it's there and we have directions for, um, for our church services, it's actually what we're doing now on a Sunday morning has to be different because we're not a group of people who live together and work together and live in the same village. More and more, so our church that we rave about that Caitlin, is, who's our student minister, said she actually got to talk to people about where they came from. She said, hardly anyone lives in that area right near church. Most people travel. So how do they have a culture of actually looking after each other and being brothers and sisters in Christ? Simon and I served in Namibia, which is a different situation again. It's not got an Anglican heritage, um, but it does have its own unique issues. It's not safe to go out at night, so Bible studies at night aren't an option. Transport is expensive for people, to, so to save up for a taxi fare once a week is a good plan. To save up for a taxi fare and go to church more than once a week is quite a challenge. So then they go to church on Sunday, and Sunday is the Lord's Day, and it's not surprised, not, as Pete said, Pete was talking about a different country, but it's not unusual for the church services to go for three hours. That's just what you do. Some other African countries, they go for five or six hours. Um, and the sermon will go for an hour, and the bit that took us a long time, so we talk about culture, culture can change. The bit that took us a while was the bit where they said, would anyone like to bring a word or a song? And you look around the church and you're never really quite sure what's going to happen next. <laughs> and sometimes it was great, sometimes it was crazy. It, like, I remember one particular day, one of the uh, more rat-baggy 12-year-olds 12-year-old boys decided he'd come up. I'm thinking, oh, gosh, what's going to happen here? And he came up the front and wanted, just wanted to tell us that his friend from school didn't go to church, so he should, thought he should bring him and introduce us to the friend that he bought from... Like, how great's that? How much do you think as he's walking up, what's he going to say? Oh, dear. Um, so I think we, we changed. It took us a while. We had to recognise how we found that hard and that... We're used to it. We're used to knowing if you're leading the service, you know what's going to happen in the service. It's a, it is different not knowing what it's going to be like. Um, but I think as Pete was talking to us about this morning, as leaders, we need to think through why we do what we do. And if you're convinced of the other half of church, you need to be convinced of it yourself. Think about how it's going to work and then start to take people along with you on the journey. What would that look like in your church? Um, how can we change expectations? How could we encourage people to think of staying longer on a Sunday? Which I think is going to, or maybe we talk about it later, but we've 
actually COVID has reduced. Sunday can be 55 minute YouTube for people. How do we start to expand that again? That's actually gonna take a lot of thinking and a lot of planning and a lot of conversations and a lot of relationships. Um, so, and just thinking through what is it that we wanna to do together when people come in and maybe haven't seen each other all week, what is it that we're doing together on a Sunday? So just as we finish uh, uh, talking about trends and developments, I just want to note with you that a number of these trends and developments actually run against um, theological values that we hold and we hold dear. The, the priest of all believers uh, I've mentioned, uh, we've talked about, uh, Pete this morning particularly was talking about the significance of the one another commands and how integral they are to congregational life. And all of these trends that, that we've been talking about are ones that actually pressure us in another direction. So we just recognise that that's going on. And, and I want to just restate a question that Pete uh, posed for us this morning. Do you, do you genuinely believe that the body of Christ is impoverished if these things are not practised and expressed when we get together? Do we genuinely think we'd be better off if we had a way of expressing and putting into practice the one another commands as we gathered. Uh, and if we do, it's going to require culture change. And so let's move on to thinking about shifting cultures and expectations. Uh, how do we do that? It's going to take hard, concentrated work. Uh, Maggie, can you just pass my Bible up? Um, uh, Thanks. Um, so we're talking about things that will involve and impact the whole congregation. And any change to that then is going to uh, be something that we need them to buy into and to own. So we actually need to lead a congregation to this change rather than just kind of announcing it or something. Okay? So how do you lead culture change? How do you lead transformation? Please open the Bible with me. Uh, I want to take you to a passage that, uh, well, I'm not sure what uh, workshop you were in before lunch, but uh, hasn't, uh, in my experience so far that today, got a lot of attention. Romans 12. And Romans 12 uh, is, a, is a great uh, chapter. Uh, it's a great chapter that begins with the most famous kind of transformation passage of the New Testament uh, and goes on to detail all kinds of ways in which this transformation will result in whole congregations serving one another in love. Okay, so it's got, uh, it's got a lot of resonances with the things that we've been occupied with today. But look at Romans 12 verses 1 and 2 to start with. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing and perfect will. Um, now, we're, we're going to skip over the whole uh, chapter, so I'm not going to talk about everything, but just notice with me that based on all that Paul has said in the first 11 chapters of Romans, he now turns to address the brothers and sisters, uh, and he says, well, because you and I have been so radically affected by individualism, I think we miss what he says. Look again closely, what is it that he actually says here? We read this as a command to individual believers to be personally transformed that each of us might be able to attest and approve what God's will is. That's the goal, isn't it? Hey, we get to maturity, we can test and approve, but that's not actually what it says. Do you see? First, he calls on all of them to offer their bodies, plural, as a living sacrifice, singular. Singular. The commands there, not to conform, but rather to be transformed, those commands are all plural. They're to the brothers and sisters. Okay? These are things they're to do together. And all of that happens by the renewing of 
the mind, singular, one mind. See, the congregation is to be of one renewed mind, just like in Philippians 2. And the transformation that results then is not of a splendid little group of snowflakes. It's the transformation of a congregation. All of the brothers and sisters together. See, transformation in Romans 12, it's a corporate activity or a corporate process. It's the congregation together that can test and approve what God's good, pleasing and perfect will is. We are not congregations that are led by blessedly transformed individuals who happen to now know what God's good, pleasing, perfect will is and can declare that to the rest of us. We are to be transformed communities that can discern the will of God together. And we can tell that by the way that the chapter goes on. So the chapter goes on to talk about all of the things we are to do together. Have a look from verse 3. For by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the faith God has distributed to each of you. For just as each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function, so in Christ we, though many, form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. We have different gifts according to the grace given us, if your gift's prophesying, then prophesy in accordance with your faith. If it's serving, then serve. If it's teaching, then teach. If it's to encourage, then give encouragement. If it's giving, then give generously. If it's to lead, do it diligently. If it's to show mercy, do it cheerfully. Do you see? One body, many members, all different, and all to humbly serve the others according to the grace of given us. It's important to recognise here that uh, unlike other New Testament passages, this is not all focused or confined to what happens in the formal gathering. This is about congregational life, but it's not necessarily about a formal or a single gathering. And we can tell that the whole of life um, is captured up by the nature of the sacrifice in verse 1. To offer your bodies, your lives, the whole of yourselves as a living sacrifice. And the way that the principle then is applied corporately as the chapter goes on from verse 9. Love must be sincere, hate what is evil, cling to what is good, be devoted to one another in love. Honour one another above yourselves, never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervour serving the Lord. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. Share with the Lord's people who are in need. Practice hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Mourn with those who mourn. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low position. Do not be conceited. Do not repay Anyone evil for evil, be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. If it's possible, as far as depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath, for it's written, it is mine to avenge, I will repay, says the Lord. On the contrary, if your enemy's hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you'll heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil but overcome evil with good. In our context where we're highly mobile, and as Margie said, we don't actually share life from Sunday to Sunday with one another very much at all, except in organised kind of church activities, where are we going to see these commands being obeyed? What will it look like? How will we express and model and learn to honour one another, to be joyful in hope and patient in affliction and faithful in prayer? Can I suggest if you're not struggling to live at peace with others in your church, 
that's probably because you're just not spending enough time with them. Because if you did, you'd find it really hard. Because the place is full of sinners, isn't it? And that's the nature of the one another commands here, is that it is difficult. And we need to know what this radically transformed life looks like, what it's going to mean to love one another. So that it's going to involve modelling, guidance, encouragement and some instruction. How do we move to a situation where our gatherings include opportunities for these things to be exercised and expressed? It's going to be a change in habit. It's going to be changes in expectations of the congregation. Um, not only will people, you need to be teaching it from the pulpit, but actually we'll have to show people what this looks like. How do we carry out these commands to uh, speak the truth in love to one another, encourage one another, spur one another on to love and good deeds? How do we model it from up the front? We think people should be able to see at least sometimes someone just like them up the front, someone similar enough to think, I could do that. Maybe I have something that's worth saying, something worth contributing to the congregation. And Jane was saying earlier, it can take all sorts of forms. It can be a testimony, it can be um, a poem, some, a history, a, someone else's testimony from history. Um, and, yeah, so the, it might be part of the sermon. I think sometimes it might be from the sermon last week. Um, all sorts of different options. And it might only take three to five minutes, like Jane said. But I think we also need to be okay with what happens if it doesn't take three to five minutes. What if you get someone up and they talk for 10 to 15 minutes? Is that going to be okay? Why does it worry us? Why does it worry the people in our church if then church is late, doesn't finish on time? What is it that we're holding on to that make this quite the concern if church goes long? Um, and as we said, as we go back from online church, I think we're actually going to have to talk about it, not just try and get people used to it. You may have to actually talk, to them, talk it through with them. At our church that we like to rave about, um, Avril started, I don't know, who knows when it started. When we got there, Avril used to bounce down the aisle. She'd get the guys on the tech team to play that little bit of we are family and Avril would come down the front and she would interview someone from church and it just made it like the, her attitude and then Rania who's doing it now, their attitude of what we're doing now is exciting and part of our family and really important and they never look rushed. It's never like, oh, we've got to do an interview but we need to you know, like get it over and done with. It's actually a really important part and they model that and they encourage us to listen and be excited. And we've heard all sorts of things. We've learned all sorts of things about people. So Caitlin, um, this week, I already talked about her, um, she'd been to Beach Mission and had two young girls converted at Beach Mission and how encouraging and fantastic and exciting is that? Um, we've had Jimmy stand up who we all walked through, Jimmy's precious wife having a stroke and him coming back to church for the first time and being able to talk to us about just how devastating it is. And it's a really hard time, but we're a church family and that's what we do. We sit and listen. So it's, and it's, and I remember one of the other guys who came and said he'd been encouraged to speak at, at, at um, work about something he'd heard in church and it hadn't gone really well and could we pray for him next time. So it's not always positive. It's not always conversion stories, it's family stories. We're at St Barnabas at Bosley Park. Yeah. Um, yeah, so, and just as we think about what does it look like to have people up the front of who, who maybe haven't got it all together and aren't doing it so well, if we don't have people like that up the front, what does that actually say? Is that saying... If you don't have life all together, you can't be up the front. Or is it actually somehow implicitly saying if you don't have it all together, you don't really fit into this family and we really don't want to be saying that? I've got another bit on the next page. Good point. <laughs> okay, so we're going to break in little small groups now, back into your groups again. And again, if you're online, um, and can you just maybe write a few things down and find someone at church to talk about it with? Um, five minutes this time, a different project. Can you just brainstorm what sort of people you might ask to do something up front and what you might ask them to do? So, what are the kinds of people? What might you ask them to do?
Okay, let's come back together again. Uh, who wants to share some creative ideas? Uh, who could you ask? What would you ask them to talk about? Some creative ideas? Yes. So that's a, that's a great question. I'll just repeat it for the people on the stream. Um, we're, we're asking now about the kinds of conversations that you might have in front, like during the formal part of the service in front of everybody as a means of modelling conversations afterwards. So, so part of what we want to do is to be able to put in front of uh, people at church someone who looks like you, someone who you can identify with. Someone to, to help you feel as if you also fit. So that, that's part of who we're, uh, why we're careful about who we select to be up front, um, because we, we want to be inclusive of the congregation. Yeah, so we want to model the kinds of conversations that ordinary people could have with one another at any time, but we recognise in our culture it's not normal now. And so this is about how do you shift a church culture toward that being normal? And the first thing we're saying that you need to do is actually to model that from the front. So it's a great question. If you were, uh, sorry, if you were to say what is normal at the moment? Uh, so I think part of what's normal at the moment is uh, what I was talking about at the start, that we, we actually have narrowed down the idea of ministry, that fewer and fewer people do it, and that it's becoming more and more professionalised. And I think we see that in a reluctance um, from a broad range of people in the congregation to see that they might have something to contribute in ministry themselves. Yeah, and we, we feel that we don't have something to say in, into that spiritual space. So that, that's the, the thesis we're working on, yeah. Thank you. So, yes, ideas? Fantastic. Ask somebody who's in the process of retiring how they're coping with that really big life transition. Good one. Other ideas? Yeah. You could ask maybe a parent who's figuring out what it looks like to disciple their children and modelling what that looks like in that mental space as well. Yeah, what a great idea. Ask someone who's a parent to talk about what it's like to disciple their children. Yeah, fantastic. Other ideas? Yes. So, not just asking parents about children, but asking children and asking teenagers as well uh, what it's like to be a disciple and what it's like for them to disciple others too. Absolutely. Thank you. It, it's really a kind of situation of how big's your imagination at this point, isn't it? Um, in our church... Uh, the, there's a very broad spread of ethnicities and one of the things we have to work hard at is helping people to see that whatever their ethnic background is, they're part of this family too. Uh, and so working hard to have people from Asian or Middle Eastern or uh, Southern European, uh, uh, African, all different kinds of backgrounds, that every now and then uh, at least people are seeing somebody who's like them. So age and stage we talked about uh, in a lot of those examples and ethnicity is another one. Um, one of the things that you bump up against then, though, is that you're intentionally sometimes looking for the people to have a conversation with who would not ordinarily feel comfortable to speak in front of a crowd, right? Well, here's one of the wins of COVID. We've all learnt how to do video interviews, right? And one of the great things that you can do with video recording a conversation is it's much less intimidating for a person who maybe has lower confidence, particularly if they have English as a second language, and they can take several attempts to answer your question and you can edit it down to show them in the best possible light because we project excellence, right? No. <laughs> uh, because you want to take the pressure off those who are going to feel the pressure 
the most. Okay, so, so I think that's a way in which we've learnt how we can involve more people at a lower cost. Um, so I just encourage you with that. And I think um, I've seen wonderful examples of churches uh, doing those kinds of um, things where people who wouldn't feel confident to stand in front of 100 people um, actually speak to the whole congregation but from a screen. Well, that's a win. I think that's a win. Um, so we can model these kind of conversations from the front. The next thing I think that we, we ought to do or we need to do in culture change is the thing that you recognised when we asked you, was it difficult to have that first conversation? And you said, no, because you told us what to talk about. Well, we can do the same thing at church. We can give people clear ideas about how to easily breach into a conversation that might have some more spiritual significance. Um, and this is part of uh, what Margie and I have been struck by, the, the power of this um, talking about church in two halves and thinking about the other half of church. This is not a conversation to have after church. Okay? This is not something you do once church finishes. This is an integral part of us being gathered together. This is just as important as everything that happened when you were sitting on the bus all facing the front. This kind of church is significant. These one another conversations are a way in which we speak the truth in love. Uh, and so there's all kinds of ways that if you're leading a service, you can help people into a conversation like that. So we might say something really concrete, particularly as you begin, find one other person, just try and have this one conversation. And that's a, uh, uh, that's a hurdle that most people can jump over. And you might get um, more ambitious some weeks or at other times or as the culture of church shifts. Um, some of the things I, I might say if, if I'm leading the service... Uh, when we come to the end of the liturgy and move into the second half of church, is take a chance to ask someone else this morning how they are going with whatever it was that was raised um, in the sermon. Um, or pick one or two key points from the sermon and then say to the congregation, what would it look like for you to obey that? Or what would it look like for you to grab hold of that truth, that promise? What would that look like for you? Could you tell somebody else this morning what you think that might look like for you? Uh, what questions do you still have after this service? What questions does this passage raise for you? What have you been reminded of to be thankful for? Uh, what would you like prayer for? Is there someone here that you could ask to pray for you? Uh, something this morning. Um, it, the prompts can be almost anything, and the idea is that they're concrete enough that people who are not comfortable having those kind of conversations uh, or are not practised at it could do this one small thing. That's the kind of... The culture shift bit is doing one small thing and next time trying to do a little bit more or have two of those conversations. Um, what extra reasons do you have to praise God? What does that temptation look like in your life? You can see some of the questions are actually starting to get quite personal. Um, and so um, there's a range of different ways that you can help people to concretely engage. How is this going to impact the way that you raise your children? Um, what will this look like for you as you honour your parents? Um, how will this affect the way that you relate to people at work? Why am I so keen that people have these conversations? Well, if you can't get people in church to have that conversation directly after the formal part of the service, the chance that they're going to have that conversation at another time in the week, I think, get lower and lower and lower as the week goes on. This is the easiest time to have that conversation. And so if we do want people to be speaking the truth in love to one another, encourage one another, building one another, all of those things, 
this is a moment of entry, an easy point to begin that kind of pattern. And there's another reason too. It's not just that we want people having these conversations with one another in church. But if you can't speak about spiritual matters with your brothers and sisters in church, there is no way you're going to broach a spiritual conversation with somebody who's not in church. It's actually very difficult to imagine that you're going to have that kind of conversation with somebody who perhaps is not already a believer. McCrindle did a bunch of research in 2019 uh, about the spiritual conversations that people in Australia were having. And around Australia, people are having all kinds of spiritual conversations. And although 62% of people in some sense identify uh, with Christianity, they may not call themselves a Christian, but they uh, have a Christian heritage, 45% of people um, in Australia call themselves Christian. And yet, Less than 30% of Australians have a conversation about the Lord Jesus more than once every three months. And just let that dribble in for a minute. What that means is that it's not even all of the people who go to church that are having a conversation about Jesus once every three months. And if they are, it can only be with other people who are already going to church. So if we want people to be having conversations about uh, significant things, then we need to practice that in church that they can do it in other places as well. Two two other things that will really help uh, do this. Food lubricates conversation. Serve good food. Um, If you want people to hang around, serve lots of food. If you want them to be gone in five minutes, serve Arnott's biscuits. Amen to that. Well, I'm lurking and interrupting because we have a few questions uh, it would be good to get to. Um, And we could fit a couple more in. And so the Slido number, if you haven't got it already, is 148593. So if there's anything that you, any burning questions you have, um, now is the moment. So do you want to both come up and you can decide between you who's going to answer the questions? Um, And some of these perhaps you've clarified since this was asked. Could you please expand on why you said women in particular find themselves cut out of things when the focus is on the excellent few? Uh, Tad, the the reason I was saying that is that as we've gone to streaming things, um, the things that we've said are non-negotiable is we're we're maybe going to have a sermon and there's a preacher and we're going to have a service leader and there are many congregations Uh, that don't have women leading services, the number of roles, the number of possibilities for things that people are doing shrinks down. And as you shrink that down, I think that's the way in which it disproportionately uh, impacts women, that there are just fewer parts, and some of those parts in a a church that is committed to a complementarian view of ministry, particularly uh, where there may only be uh, men preaching, that actually really does reduce down the opportunities that women have um, to speak to the congregation. I think you've probably answered this. Should we encourage more ordinary people to participate in gatherings at the front? How do we do this? Anything extra to add? No, yes. No, yes, no. (laughs) Okay. As people, you two, who have lived in a different culture... What are the good things and the bad of Australian culture and the way they impact our church experience? Okay. Um, So I mentioned as I was going through Romans 12 that um, the individualism that is just the air that we breathe impacts the way that we read the Bible so significantly and we're unaware of the impact that that has but I think that filters through the, the, the entire way that we engage as churches. We engage as individuals and we actually find this stuff of genuinely loving one another quite difficult and foreign. Uh, and so in Namibia, which is a collectivist, uh, well, it's a whole range of cultures, but they're all collectivist, um, particularly compared to Australia, um, they actually get that piece much more. 
And I think that another cultural value, the, the way that we value polished excellence in, in presentation really does cut down the number of people that can be involved. So I can't imagine church running for three hours uh, here in Australia because I wouldn't find that many people who are prepared to stand up and sing a song. Whereas in Namibia, everyone belonged to two or three choirs, so they got lots of chances to sing a song. Um, is, yeah, so culturally, those things are quite different. What about a positive about Australian <laughs> culture? Um, I think one of the positives about Australian culture in terms of hospitality is that we do have low bar hospitality. <laughs> okay? So we, we, we don't feel um, that we can only invite people over if we've got all the silverware polished and... and, and you know, life is completely ordered and the house is 100% immaculate. I think that's a really big advantage. Um, MasterChef came in while we were out of the country. Bad impact on hospitality, OK? Get back to serving sausages or whatever, but not necessarily sausages. Um, low bar hospitality, I think, is really winsome. sort of the same I think we so we were going to talk about a bit about the what you actually provide after church in terms of hospitality and I think we can in Australia get away with just some aunt's biscuits but actually part of what helps us to stay is is more than that so it's a it's a plus and a minus we can have low bar hospitality but one of the thing great joys in our church is that aunt's biscuits featured during COVID and that was it they don't feature normally because actually we want to love each other and the one of the ways we can do that is to to bake for each other. <laughs> no, it's not necessarily baking, but to be serving each other and putting a higher priority on food. So it's both things, isn't it? It's great that we can cope with it, but maybe we need to expand. Hmm. Thanks for balancing that contradiction. <laughs> okay. Um, who has these excellent standards? Um, do you think it comes from the leadership at church or the congregants? Is it informed by comparison to other churches? Is it the church shopping phenomenon or something? Yeah, it's interesting. I'll see as we were preparing, it's, we heard a lot. If churches go over, as I think that we, we knew in the churches we were running in Australia, if church goes long, you hear about it. And it's really interesting to think, okay, how many people does that actually upset? And should we just be a bit more honest about it? We would hear about it, but I think what Pete said is, was Pete, wasn't it? That you don't hear the positives, you just hear the negatives. And certainly we would hear it from the congregation that it needs to be under a certain time, it needs to be slick. But yeah. I but I, I think there has been um, an intentional drive for excellence, particularly, um, uh, say, for in churches where the culture's to go for the five M's and you have a magnification uh, section or ministry within the church. Um, uh, often where people are given a, a particular responsibility for whatever it is, of course you want to be excellent. Um, so I have heard that expressly taught, um, uh, particularly in congregational leadership um, training. OK, I'm going to combine two questions here. Um, our church uses godliness to determine who gets up the front. To what extent should this affect decisions about who we see? Can our standards be too high? And then the other question is, are there reasons someone wouldn't speak up the front? Is it plausible to have everyone in church doing something up the front during the year? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, yes, godliness is actually supposed to be the measure. Um, uh, but it's, it's not a... Um, uh, you have a different scale depending on what you're asking people to do. Uh, and so if I'm asking somebody to preach, I've got very high expectations about... Um, uh, about how they are applying the Word of God in their life. Um, and I might have uh, lesser expectations of people if I'm asking them to do different things. I would have an interview with somebody that I was less sure of and, uh, and uh, somebody who, who had worked harder and had more confidence in uh, I might actually hand the microphone to them, but that's a higher bar. Uh, and no, not everybody is going to be up front in church. Uh, I think it's important to have all kinds of people, not all people. Yeah. So the moral of the story, hold a, hold a 
microphone really tight sometimes. Try, try not. Yeah, this is this is bad. Otherwise, you have to kind of get it back. Yeah. Um. Oh, I've lost it. This voting system changes the position. Just keeps moving around. Um, something about guarding the pulpit. Just looking for it. And what are the long-term effects of guarding the pulpit? Will churches be disadvantaged in the future by ministers who've had less preaching training? Uh, yeah, again, a great question. And I think there is a risk. Uh, I think there's a number of risks where our guarding of the pulpit is not about uh, faithfulness and godliness, but actually becomes around uh, a, a level of uh, proficiency or even of jealousy, uh, where you have only one or two people who ever get to speak. Um, I think that, that, that is a real risk for us. So uh, we want to make sure that the teaching of the word is excellent, uh, but I think in every congregation there's going to be more people capable of doing that than are invited to do it currently. This might be our last question. Often post-church is prime welcoming time. If newcomers are a mixture of Christian and non-Christian, how do we balance welcoming and gospel conversation amongst regulars? Um, yeah, again, a great question. So in evangelism, in terms of helping people who are not yet Christian to understand what it is to be a Christian, uh, we've got to recover the wonder of Christian fellowship. It is absolutely extraordinary Christian fellowship and people who had no contact with it, it's, it's often one of the most attractive things. You know, for all of the mess and the trouble that we have uh, with, with a, a church full of sinners, um, the fact that people are trying to love one another is magnetically attractive. And I think having genuine conversations where I don't necessarily expect, well, I certainly don't expect the unbeliever uh, to come with a whole bunch of uh, knowledge. Uh, I'm not going to ask them some of those really sticky questions, but it's no bad thing at all for them to be next to a conversation where somebody is confessing their sins, admitting their weakness, rejoicing and being thankful rather than grumbling. So, so I do think I want to encourage those conversations to happen, that the unbelievers can at least hear them, even if they're not participating themselves. Yeah, and just if you think it through, how sad would it be if someone's just heard a sermon and they've been moved and we're, we're nervous about asking whatever question it is and we tend to talk about the weather or the football? Like, they've come along to church, they've possibly heard the gospel or some part of the Bible expounded for the first time, they're going to have questions and I think it's our nervousness that leads us to want to talk about something easy. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, well, <clears throat> I feel quite challenged about my passive, lazy, post-COVID leave after church <laughs> attitude. <laughs> and I think by the questions that you've been asking that you're thinking about it too. So thank you so much, Simon and Margie. Can you, would you mind closing in prayer oh, for us, Simon? Yeah, yeah. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the glorious gift of fellowship this side of heaven that you have given us brothers and sisters to gather with week by week. We thank you for that. And Father, we do want to repent of the times where we have not valued that fellowship in the way that we ought to. Uh, and we want to repent of the times where we've not invested in those relationships in the way that we ought to. And we pray, Father, that you'd fill us with joy at the prospect of spending more time with our brothers and sisters. And we pray in your kindness, Father, that you give us lots of opportunities to be truthing in love, to be encouraging one another and spurring one another on to love and good deeds. And we pray, Father, that this would not be a burdensome thing, but a great joy, because by your Spirit, you move us to experience it in that way. And so we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.